Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror media. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the second season of Crypt TV's Look See, subtitled The Second Hands. Look See is my favorite monster series on Crypt TV, and I covered his first season in a mini Kill Count earlier this year. You can click up there to see that. It starts at about two minutes into the video. For the second season of Look See, Crypt TV brought back writer-director Landon Stommer for another four episodes, so the quality is the same top-notch stuff we got in season one. That means lots of cool camera tricks, bitchin' sound design, and masterful jump scares. So here's your warning that I'm going to include some of them throughout this video. Season 2 of our favorite fancy monster is a prequel of sorts, set in an old-timey era that gives us a little peek into look past. It features crooked bankers, reluctant robbers, and for some reason, this Gordon Hayward-looking jackass running around in the woods. It also features a bunch of fun kills, so let's get to them. Season 2 begins in Depression-era New York, where an angry crowd is hollering up at the apartment of- Oh, damn! That lady just got thwacked in the face with a fire poker. Looks like we're starting this season off on a pretty dark note, with Barbara Capshaw and her two kids joining the kill count immediately. And the poor kids never even learned how to properly make a bed before they died. Pillowcases go over pillows, not your own heads, you silly billies. As in most cases where a family's patriarch kills his wife and kids, this dude Robert ends up offing himself as well, with a self-inflicted throat slit, and his blood splatters onto a picture that tells us who he is. One of two twins, the Capshaw Bros, who opened a bank at exactly the wrong time in history. I wonder what the other, less murder suicide brother is up to. We meet up with him as he's hiking through the woods with his family. They've still got shadows of finery on their backs, but they've left everything else behind on their run from angry rabble-rousers. Even though pretty soon, they about to be on the run from something else. Yeah, better go on and get, little girl. They find themselves at a Hooverville version of Base Douth Rack, and before you can say hereditary, it's nighttime at their new home. Good thing there's nothing creepy about this place, right? You know, except for shit like that. Father James Capshaw steps outside and sees his barn door closed. Good thing, it's always embarrassing when you realize you left it open. When he goes to inspect it further, he finds a foreclosure notice from his very own bank posted on the door. And you can't escape big finance by crumpling that shit up, dog. You know damn well better. Inside the barn is a lot more of those notices hanging up, as well as a ticking clock. Quick, price is right, Capshaw. How much do you think that watch is worth? Final answer? A single dollar? Oh, looks he don't like people who play it safe like that. So Capshaw finds a note on the back of that dollar. If you yourself cannot release, then it'll come to take a piece. <laughs> He gets knocked to the ground and then dragged across the barn floor, watch in hand, until he looks up to see that fancy monster man- Oh, wait, no, it's just some dirty boy and a pair of his pals peering down. The bandits cover Capshaw's mouth and get to robbing him, starting with that wicked timepiece. But lead bandit Raymond takes things a little too far and takes out a switchblade so he can stab James in the side with it. Not just once, but a whole bunch of times. Jesus, dude, what's the matter with you? Watch too many horror movies or something? Raymond's associates are equally disturbed by his outburst, and one of them, Will William trips over a lantern while backing up. That earns him an impalation with a pitchfork, as seen in a series of great shots that reveal the extent of his injuries to the other two bandits. Man, that is forked up. Even more forked up? There are motherfucking looks he's standing right there. Aw, oh, shit! Yeah, this is the part where you two get the fuck out of there. Don't trip on your way out, dicks! They hightail it out into the night, and during their way through the trees, Thomas stops to briefly check the time. Bandit or not, it's important to keep a schedule. But little does he know that watch belongs to our favorite fancy man. Yeah, he gon' get it. Episode 2 begins with a nightmare of William looking at the camera. Thomas wakes up from it, thankfully not having peed himself since he's sharing a tent with a real peaceful looking sleepy boy there, and instead he goes outside to relieve his bladder against a tree. While he does, Looksy appears and then disappears behind him. Too slow, Tommy boy. And then all of a sudden, there's a note on the tree. I guess Looksy advertises the same way clubs at universities do. Just stick a flyer in front of a urinal, it'll definitely get looked at. When Thomas goes back to the tent, he finds it empty, but don't worry if you're a snuggler little buddy. There's someone outside who can wrap his long, creepy arms around you and hold you tight. But then the silhouette just kind of disappears, so maybe Tommy's stuck sleeping alone tonight. Nah, just playing. You so fucking dead, Thomas. He takes off running, but stops like an idiot to watch Looksy play peekaboo with his tent. And when the monster reappears close at hand behind a tree, Thomas is out of there. A root stops him and gives him a serious leg injury, but that's nothing compared to the head grab that just happened. Whoa, where'd he even go? We see where he went after Raymond gets back from an ancillary robbery and finds Thomas's shoe on the ground. Ray Ray looks up and gets a Kerry White special to the face. Man, that looks messy. I bet it would take like three long showers just to clean 
burning it all off, but that's just a guess, you know? We finally see Thomas's body after it falls in front of Raymond, and holy shit, that boy was literally broken and high off. And we ain't talking your usual bifurcation, this dude got split into hot dog style. Very awesome, and as Raymond can attest to, very bloody. Raymond starts looking around and senses the look-see behind him, so he takes out his knife to get all stabby-stabby again. But looks like that shit ain't gonna fly with the big LS, so Raymond drops his knife and runs off into the woods. We get a real cool escape sequence that, fun fact, was shot just an hour before sunrise. It was one of the last things filmed for the season. Just when Raymond thinks he's free, he gets a fingerless red glove wrapped around his throat, and Looksee lifts him up off the ground for an excellent isometric exercise. Looksee, you so swole, dude. But a deeper look into Raymond's soul, murder and all, leaves Looksee a little less smiley than usual, and he drops Raymond to the ground. Guess this guy didn't have anything to release, so he takes all his pieces and walks off into the woods, the Looksee disappearing into thin air empty-handed. The episode ends with the pocket watch getting grabbed again. In episode 3, we're back to the rest of James Capshaw's family. His wife Mary isn't coping well with her new surroundings, and is reluctant to shed her rock and roll lifestyle. On a table, she finds a classic creepy little kid drawing, but boy, that thing could use a little more color. Before Mary can find a bigger Crayola pack for her kids, though, a creaking noise draws her into the shadowy recesses of her new home. Ah, oh, a bloody fur coat? It's like a PG version of Fatal Attraction's Bunny Stew. The back of that drawing features a familiar refrain, and then it's off with the heels. <laughs> Looksy's here to hang upside down and wreck this lady's lifestyle, and he's all sick of hanging upside down. It's nausea-inducing, you know? Mary tries to run away, but is stopped in her tracks and hoisted by her own pearl necklace. It lifts her into the air and threatens to choke the life out of her until finally it breaks and she's free. Good thing that's over with. <laughs> Oh shit, back into the bedroom, back into the bedroom. There she finds a dead little boy on the bed. It's a vision of her youngest son Theodore, who died before the story took place, and not in a flashback so he doesn't go on the count. Learn the rules here. She's sad to see him like this, but at least he comes bearing gifts. Namely, that pearl necklace she can't seem to let go of. And you know what the consequences for that is. In this case, a kid spurting blood out his mouth and the look-see popping down from the ceiling. Sorry Mary, but it's time for a piece to get taken. Mary's daughter Leah is the one who finds her dead with a hole through her torso. Her body slumps over and lands next to that drawing as Mary lands the next spot on the kill count. Leah takes a bit of her mom's blood and uses it to make an addition to her drawing, one that doesn't bode well for older brother David, especially since Leah's not exactly hanging out with the right crowd nowadays. Ooh, creepy camera spike. Speaking of brother David, he was out doing God knows what with a lantern, but heard Mary scream, so he's probably relieved when he returns to find her standing in the window. Yep, nothing looks wrong here. Everything's normal. Inside the barn, he finds a stuffed teddy, and that teddy's got a little pouch with a note inside. Better let go of that dead baby bro, David, or else you'll be joining him sooner than you think. Hard to get over the dead when there are pictures of them everywhere, though. Or, you know, when they're standing right behind you. Spooky ghost stuff, I like it. Back inside, David takes his torch and teddy to look for the rest of his family, and he finds Mary in the corner all Blair Witchy with a bloody shrug. Why do we only see the back of her? Could we get a better look at- Oh, never mind. That shit's creepy as hell. Reverse, reverse. David goes to leave, but gets cornered by Luxie at the door. He too retreats into the bedroom, not knowing his little sister is standing outside just counting down to his death. He has a premonition that maybe he's too tied up emotionally to his dead little bro, and then he figures it out. If he can just destroy that teddy, everything will be okay. After killing the bear, you'd think he's in the clear, but nope, Luxy hand coming at ya! God, I love the shot of that teddy bear carcass scuttling across the floor. As David looks on with tear in his eye, Luxy comes out from beneath the bed, and despite the brother apparently having let go, he's yanked back into the room and killed by Luxy, as revealed by his very artsy looking corpse corpse with his head on backwards. Damn, I was really rooting for you, David. With her family dead, Leah heads back inside and sets the watch on the ground right as the hands high-five each other. They spin around counterclockwise and the watch face opens up to reveal. What's it gonna reveal, Leah? Nothing, I guess? Just kidding, kid! It's some more gloves! Personally, I can't wait to see what this creature is, stretching out of the watch and making Leah's eyes go wide, but I guess I'm gonna have to, cause with one last look-see at our locales, this season is over! In this trip to the 30s, was the look-see just as hurdy? Let's find out and get to the numbers. What? What is that? Ah! 
Nine people died in the second season of Look See, which is less than the first, but that's not adjusting for inflation. Of the victims, there were six males and three females. I only know because I read the script, which names those two Capshaw kids killed in the beginning. With a runtime of 20 minutes, we had a kill on average every 2.22 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to William and the pitchfork through his back. I love the reveal of it, and it's also helped by that creepy shot later on of him smiling at the camera. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to James Capshaw, since he just got stabbed a few times, and honestly dude, look at that bandit. You could take him easy. And that's it. Season 2 of Look See came out on Crypt TV just a few weeks ago, and you can watch the whole thing by clicking up there, which I highly recommend you do since it's got a lot of great sound design not featured in this kill count. Plus, it's got a few extra shots of that handsome bandit. Make sure you subscribe to Crypt TV to take advantage of their insane 3 a week release schedule. And for all you Sunny Cult fans, I got you fam, with a kill count of Season 3 next Sunday. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this fun extra kill count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Thomas Slade and Travis Payne. I also want to thank some more people who have been patrons for over a year. People like Lane Woods, Nathan Smith, Jamie Green, and Mary Jo March. And of course, huge thanks to Crypt TV for partnering with me for this kill count. Again, make sure you subscribe to them because there will be more of me on that channel in the future. Alright, thanks y'all. Be good people.